This week on Dialogue, in the wake of war, Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Our guest this week is Cynthia Arnson. She serves as director of the Wilson Center's Latin American program and is the editor of this book, In the Wake of War, Democratization and Internal Armed Conflict in Latin America. Cindy, welcome back from your travels and welcome back to Dialogue. Thank you, John. Good to have you it's here. And congratulations here. on completing this epic piece of work. And Thank that's you. where I want to start. I want to, if you could just describe for our viewers and listeners the scope of this work and the time frame involved in putting it all together. Sure. Well, the project that we've had here at the Wilson Center on Comparative Peace Processes um, really began in 1995. Um, and they, um, after the El Salvador um, insurgency had, had been brought to an end after the end of the, of the war in Nicaragua, um, and so there was a sense that, wow, you know, it was possible, and Guatemala was in the process of peace negotiations, there was a sense that it was possible to find negotiated settlements to these, you know, long, bloody, and violent conflicts. And so the project really began with, a, with the central question of how was it possible to, to do this in Central America, what explained why it was possible um, to come to peace settlements, and what lessons might there be for other countries in the region, including in Peru um, and in Colombia, that were still undergoing armed insurgency. And so there was an, a, a first book that came out in 1999, which I think was much more optimistic, quite frankly, than, than, um, than where we are now 10, 12 years um, later. Um, and I think the, you know, the lessons have been really, really sobering um, um, over the last decade about the difficulties of making the transition from war to peace, from democratization, from, from authoritarianism to democracy, um, you know, from militarization to demilitarization. I mean, all of those processes, you know, have been much more complicated. Um, and there have been many steps, you know, backwards um, than we would have ever imagined. And now the countries that, such as El Salvador and Guatemala, Honduras, which was not directly um, a country of internal conflict, but was deeply impacted by what happened on its borders, you know, both in El Salvador um, and in Nicaragua. I mean, those three countries are, are, are three of the most violent countries in the entire world, criminal violence, gang violence, um, violence related to organized crime. And so you look at them and you say, wow, you know, this many years down the road, what, what happened and, and why have things in many ways gotten worse while certain things have gotten better? So this was an attempt really to, to step back and say, where have we come? Where have these countries um, gone? What are the, the, the areas of, of light? What are the areas of shadow, as one of the authors of the book you know, describes, um, that can really, and, and what are the lessons that we can draw about the difficulties of, of building a democratic system and an inclusionary economic framework um, in countries that have gone, undergone you know, internal armed conflict? As you were describing the, uh, the initial euphoria, at a time of change, uh, then looking back over time and what went wrong, why haven't we made more progress, why did we, I was really uh, having an association with the Arab Awakening right now, and that there's always this rush of enthusiasm and it's all going to just happen overnight, but this is a marathon, this is not, and that's, the book clearly illustrates this, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. It is definitely a marathon, and, and, and the, the real, I mean, the real question is whether given the challenges now, um, the challenges posed by globalization, the rise of transnational organized crime, um, whether the forces that work against a democratic outcome are eventually going to be more powerful than those that are working in favor of a democratic outcome. And I think, you know, the, the jury is still out on that one, but there are just enormous challenges that were not contemplated, you know, in 1992 or even 1996 when the peace accords were signed in El Salvador and then in Guatemala. Um, in Nicaragua, it was hard to imagine after the election that at, in 1990, which brought the opposition to power, got the Sandinistas who had taken power by force of arms out that, that Daniel Ortega would come back and be such a dominant, you know, political force in the country in ways that have proven to be, you know, very authoritarian and have challenged, you know, the legitimacy of democratic elections. So I think, you know, there's a lot that we can, um, that we can reflect on um, this far 
you know, uh, down the road that was not, I mean, issues that have come up that were not immediately apparent in the, um, in the, in the post-war phase. How, how about the, uh, the impressive uh, collection of contributors that you've assembled? How did you uh, come up with that? Well, we have, um, I think, almost without exception, the, the countries, the, the, the case studies um, are written by people from those countries, um, with one or two exceptions, you know, he, here and there, but there are, you know, it's... So the, lots the of translation is, work for the editor. A lot of translation <laughs> and editing work, no question. Um, but I think it really adds to the, um, the, the the seriousness and also the authenticity of the volume that, that, you know, approximately half of the authors, if not a little bit more, are people who are from those countries and originally, you know, were writing um, their works in, in Spanish. So it, it, it took a long time to, to turn this, uh, this book out, but I think that the end result is, is, is well worth it. Beyond the obvious advantage of someone being from a place and having intimate knowledge of it, uh, were there subtleties that emerged as you were editing the book that, were, that you thought to yourself, only someone who's lived, grown up here, eat, slept, and, and, and dreamt here could come up with these insights? Right. Well, I think, you know, one of the advantages is that some of the, there, there's a combination of, of older, more senior people and, and younger mm -hmm. people who are, um, you know, earlier in their careers. And, um, and that combination of insights is also very valuable. For example, the El Salvador um, uh, chapter is written, excuse me, the Guatemala chapter is written by one of the most preeminent sociologists in Central America, Edelberto Torres Rivas, who brings just a rich experience of his own experience of the war, his period in exile, and then his move back to Guatemala to participate in many of the transformations that have taken place in the country. He's currently a consultant with the United Nations Development Program. So he was really in a position to look at the entire sweep um, of the years of counterinsurgency, of repression, um, of the negotiations um, of a peace accord, and then the evolution of, uh, of, of Guatemalan history in those, in those years after the signing of the accord. And I think it's a really, um, it's a really stunning achievement that uh, you know, that he has brought his insights, you know, into this yeah, book. And, and that multi-generational approach that you describe, but people of different ages, that's unique as well. Exactly. Uh, most books tend to look at it from one uh, one uh, point of view in that regard. Right, and there are a number of very junior researchers that partnered with uh, with senior scholars to produce the chapters, for example, on Chiapas in Mexico, um, or the one on the rise of, of criminal violence in, in, in Mexico and Central America. And I think it's a really, it's a richness of the book that it combines those per perspectives. You referenced the earlier book that preceded this and the earlier work, and one of the things that you uh, list as a conclusion of that that still holds up, which I find fascinating and I'd like you to expand on, is mm -hmm. negotiations themselves advance the process of democratization. Right. Do they set the tone? Do they sort of set the, the rules for engagement of how these previously warring parties are going to build a democracy? Right. Well, the Peace Accord itself, I think, sets out a lot of that institutional architecture for the establishment of a, of a democratic electoral system. Um, and the negotiations, the fact that, that the two warring parties are sitting down with or without the presence of an international mediator has a way of sort of, um, of, of just putting a damper on, on the violence, um, on the, the extrajudicial killings and, and murders and assassinations that, that take place, you know, as, as part, and, and parcel, you know, of an insurgents and, and counterinsurgency war, um, and so I think that 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 space that's provided to actors across civil society does create, you know, some possibility, you know, for a democratic opening. Um, and it's undeniable that in almost all of these countries, you know, there's a much more free and active press. There are investigative journalists. There is a more vibrant civil society. But of course, depending on the case, I mean, under enormous pressure. Um, and it would be, I think, a, a, a mistake to see um, the glass as, as, uh, as half full as, as much as, as half empty. I mean, there are still, you know, cases of, you know, murders of journalists, you know, in Guatemala certainly in Mexico covering you know the uh, you know the, the rise of narco trafficking in that country um, and so you know the process of peace does give some oxygen you know to um, reformers and uh, to those who are trying to create a more democratic society um, but it's by no means you know um, uniform or even the we also talk about these these countries when they uh, when a conflict ends as now in a transition phase but you raise the provocative question of transition to what <laughs> 
that's often just assumed, but it, it needs closer examination. Right. Well, in, in Latin America, I think the, the social scientists that were writing about the transition from military dictatorship to democracy talked about that period as a transition. Much of that work actually was done here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, and then there was a sense that after a period of transition, there was a period of consolidation, and then there would be something kind of fixed that would constitute a consolidated democratic system. And I think most people who have looked at democracy and democratization in the region in the southern cone, the military dictatorship transitions, as well as the, the, the conflict transitions, have kind of done away with that, the sense that there's like an end point at which, uh, at, you know, at which you can say that a democratic system has been established or has arrived. This is a long-term process. The process of institutional building and, and institutional transformation goes on for generations. There are countervailing inst you know, um, influences. And I think most people now who are looking at democracy in the region talk about democratic quality um, and have pointed to the key role of institutions in providing for citizenship and providing for an effective uh, state that is constrained by the rule of law. And those kinds of things have been very, very difficult to build, mostly in these conflict cases where the rule of law didn't exist prior to the outbreak of conflict. What, what are, if you were building a sort of a hierarchy of most difficult, what are the most difficult uh, ingredients that go into building a democracy almost from scratch? You mentioned things like building civil institutions or, or civil, civic culture, uh, uh, healing old wounds, just reconciliation, um, all kinds of rebuilding an economy. W is there a way to break this down and what tends to be the most significant barrier, the one that takes the most time? Well, I think there are multiple tasks that, that a state um, has to engage in, sometimes with the support of the international community, in order to establish its legitimacy in a post-war order. Um, one of the first things that has to happen um, is the provision of security. Um, and, you know, a, a demobilization of combatants, their integration, um, and the containment of, um, you know, of, of armed elements that are resisting a peace accord, but also the consolidation of of security institutions that operate within a new democratic framework. That is absolutely essential, and I think these cases really, you know, bear that out, that the, that the inability to make that transition, you know, um, in the security institutions is a real weakness. There are also, these. I'm sorry, excuse me to step, step yeah. on your last thought there, uh, Cindy, but the, uh, one of the things that the book illustrates in is that even though the official violence, if you can call it that ends, the you know, peace accord is signed, violence continues, and often at similar rates to during when it was war-torn, but now just in a different environment, crime, youth crime, drugs, uh, those types of things as well. Right. Well, I think that the, the security crisis, particularly in what's called the Northern Triangle of, of Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, you know, really is, is rooted in a failure to transform the security institutions, um, you know, and in the, in the post-war era to give them legitimacy, and oftentimes the state response um, sometimes for political advantage, you know, the so-called mano lura, the iron fist approach, only exacerbated the problem um, by increasing the prison population, uh, making prisons into sort of, you know, universities for, for criminality, as, as many observers in the region, you know, have noted. Um, and that's, you know, been a central failure and one of the things that actually detracts from the democratic legitimacy of, of the governments that have been that have been established. In, well, in also the seemingly an understandable failure in that a country that has been war-torn would desire a strong hand when it comes to uh, building that security that is necessary. Right. But, the, but the fact that there were strong military governments in a number of these countries that, that routinely abused human rights, that were responsible for massive human rights violations, and again, in the case of Peru, the, the, the majority of the violations committed by the insurgents themselves in, in Colombia today, that's, I think, where the, where the, um, the greatest number you know, of human rights violations and violations of international humanitarian uh, laws, you know, come come into play um, but there but wherever there is a demand uh, for for greater security there is um, there is often you know an erosion of, of trust in the democratic system in, in approval for the democratic system and and an acceptance of return to authoritarianism simply to stop you know the the crime and violence what, if, if it's okay with you what I'd like to do now is um, name the seven countries one by one 
that you selected to cover in the book and have you just give us a brief snapshot of each that pointing out uh, we've talked about some of the things that are unique or not, that are, are, are not unique but that are generalized generalizations we can make across the board to any emerging democracy or any country that's rebuilding itself after conflict but it might also be interesting to hear what's particularly unique about these countries that separates it from the group uh, a particular situation that needs to be overcome that isn't one that is generic in nature so let's start with uh, Colombia. Okay, well, Colombia has made enormous strides, um, in part because of, of the massive amounts of U.S. assistance. There have been major um, advances against the guerrillas. Um, there have been the successes in, 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 um, in reducing drug trafficking, although drug trafficking continues to be a serious problem by, uh, by, by insurgent groups, by the FARC in particular, but also by these rearmed, you know, paramilitary groups and criminal bands that operate in a lot of, of the country. But I think what's happened now under the government of Juan Manuel Santos, who took office in, in 2010, is that there's been an effort to combine the security advances that were made under the Uribe government with advances in addressing this long simmering social deficit um, in providing land and, and land restitution to people that were forced off of their land by paramilitary groups or drug, traffic, drug trafficking uh, groups in the 1980s. There's been um, restitution to victims um, of violence. All of these things are very, very complicated and fraught with difficulty, but nonetheless, the, um, the willingness to, to take on that kind of, you know, socioeconomic dimension um, is is a real step forward and I think a real um, a real advance in in Colombia despite as I say these um, um, the ongoing problem with with criminal and, and drug trafficking violence um, let's see alphabetically I El guess Salvador we, is El next. Salvador yes, we we'll come next we come course. next well there you saw in 2009 the transfer of the peaceful transfer of power from a conservative right-wing government arena to the government of um, the party of the former guerrillas um, both the arena party and and the and the FMLN um, had to moderate in some in, in in some aspect you know proposing candidates that did not come out of their own ranks in order to win an election um, but the but you know El Salvador shows as does um, you know Nicaragua that you know when there are these cleavages you know FMLN anti FMLN Sandinista anti Sandinista you know uh, divides in society during the war that cleavage gets reproduced in the country's politics and I think polarization in El Salvador continues to be a huge problem um, and, and you know as we've mentioned the the problem of, of crime and violence of drugs um, and of the organ you know the ongoing or the increased activity of organized crime under pressure from from uh, you know from the uh, the combat against the cartels in Mexico you know has has also you know increased the amount of narco trafficking uh, as a transit area that El Salvador is experiencing so it's still a country with with deep problems that has made you know nonetheless some social advances those cleavages I'm, I imagine could become worse when you take away the control of a, a strong uh, military government or military rule Right. That can well, clamp down on some of these things exactly, in, in ways that are unnatural. Exactly, and and I think what what this uh, what what this book illustrates is that when you have had weak institutions and parties that have grown up in the conflict and are the product of conflict, it's very difficult for them to assume the tasks of post-war peace building. You know, in the in in the post-war era, and you know the polarization continues to be very very acute. Um, you know, particularly in El Salvador, also also in Nicaragua. Um, we're up to Guatemala. We're up to Guatemala. Um, Guatemala, I think, has had the most difficulty in reforming its security apparatus. And there, I mean, there. Are, I think it's a it's an, an interesting way in which the the issues of state strengthening involve sort of two processes that are parallel but not the same. On the one hand, you have to strengthen the state against the variety of, of, of competitors, armed competitors for power, strengthen the state in its legitimate capacity. But the Guatemalan case shows more than any other that some of the illegitimate sources of authority and violence are within the state. And so you have to root them out, the so-called parallel powers that were part of, the, that grew up in the counterinsurgency era and have continued actually to this day with some efforts in some advances in um, in creating a civilian intelligence apparatus and, and demobilizing some of the worst units. But that state within a state continues to be a very, very serious problem in Guatemala and is one of the major sort of um, explanations for why drug trafficking has just exploded. What is the um, ultimate solution there? 
what needs to happen? Well, there has to be a strengthening of legitimate state capacity, and that means creating um, the, you know, a, a, a state apparatus that's capable of, in, of, of providing for security, but within the context of the rule of law, within the context, you know, of, 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 uh, of inclusion. I mean, I think it's sort of a staggering statistic that in Guatemala today, something like 50 percent of indigenous children, and mind you, indigenous peoples make up some 60 percent of the population, some half of those people, uh, children under the age of five, are malnourished. I mean, that is just, that, that's an, an amazing If I'm doing the math that's correctly, that's 30 challenge. percent of the entire population. That's something like, you're probably better at the math than uh, well, I am, but I, it's a staggering number of no. people, and the, and the decades and the centuries, really, of, of racial and ethnic exclusion are still, you know, very, very serious problems. Mm -hmm. Haiti is next. Haiti has made, I think, um, some uh, some major strides over the last years. The, the, two the 2010 earthquake was a devastating blow, not only because of the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that lost their lives, but the physical destruction of the of the of the infrastructure of the buildings that housed, you know, the Haitian state. And it's been very very difficult uh, for the Haitian leadership, you know, to come together around a project that involves you know, the, an inclusive uh, program for development. There have been billions of dollars in international assistance that have been provided, but oftentimes the international community has not been terribly coherent in terms of how it has um, provided that aid or the, the time frame for which, you know, the international community would remain engaged. But I think now Katie is, is on, you know, a, a, a positive path, you know, towards a more inclusive development, th towards more um, effective security institutions, whether or not the Haitian army becomes a, a part of that. The Haitian army was a big part of the problem. I don't see it as a part of the solution, and it is their are efforts to, to resurrect, you know, the Haitian army, mm -hmm. um, a, a force that it does not have legitimacy with the population. So I think Haiti is still very, uh, very unstable, um, despite, you know, the advances, but the, but the earthquake was just a, a devastating blow. Not sure about our math, but I know our, our alphabetization, is that the word? <laughs> what is, Mexico is next. Mexico. I know we've got that right. Mexico. M is next. Mexico. Well, you know, the Chiapas conflict was really, I mean, it's hard to sort of compare it mm -hmm. to the other armed conflicts that have lasted, you know, decades and continue, you know, this into the, the present. This the burst. Approximately 10, 12 days of, of armed violence. Um, there are still, I think, ongoing problems with the exclusion of indigenous people, of the divide between northern dynamic industrial Mexico and, and southern Mexico. Um, those are longstanding problems, but the Chiapas issue is just no longer an issue at all on the national agenda. You know, state governments have, have responded to provide, you know, uh, social programs in areas as an explicit way, not only to marginalize, you know, the Zapatistas, but also to address the kinds of social deficits that exist And only there. a small percentage of the overall population affected by a that. Small, a small, a small por portion of the population, although one could argue that the Chiapas uprising had an enormous impact on, you know, the country's democratic transition, um, you know, on allowing many, many actors calling for de democratization in the country to coalesce around, a, you know, a demands for a more um, open and, and democratic and, and plural uh, country and, and state. And I think it's also true that the, the ravages of, of drug violence in Mexico have nothing to do, you know, with the Chiapas uprising or the aftermath of, of the Chiapas uprising. It rather ha is embedded in the nature of Mexico's democratic transition, you know, in 2000, the disarticulation of networks that had provided for co-optation and, uh, you know, for, for a lot of this to go on, you know, um, you know, with much lower levels, you know, of violence. But also it's, it's very much the case that the, um, the advances in Colombia have served to push the drug trafficking, you know, elsewhere in the region, which is why most Latin American countries are, are, you know, almost unanimous in calling for a rethinking of the, the way in which we fight, you know, international narcotics trafficking. Nicaragua is next. Nicaragua is, has seen the return of the Sandinistas, has seen the implantation of one of the most exclusionary political systems um, in the entire hemisphere. 
um, but it's also a country that has been able to um, to avoid, you know, the uh, the ravages of of gang violence, um, of criminality, of, of just basic common crime, and has uh, you know really been pretty successful up until now in fighting organized crime. That's because the Sandinista police went through a process of, of uh, professionalization in the in the years after the, the, the transition from the war years to a different government. Um, and, you know, whether you like the Sandinistas or dislike the Sandinistas, there has been a sort of social solidarity component, you know, to their government since the time they took power. And I think that that combination of, of community policing, of professional policing, um, and involvement at the community level has really serve to distinguish Nicaragua from its other neighbors in Central America. And finally, last but not least, Peru. Peru is a country, is a fascinating country, and, and where the government of Ollanta Humala, you know, will go um, is very much, you know, open to question. Peru is a country that has grown by leaps and bounds it, by, in its GDP, particularly because of commodity exports, mostly to China. Um, but I think what the last electoral cycle showed was that the fruits of that of that growth of that development on the in the coastal areas concentrated around Lima had not been distributed to the highlands to the places that were the epicenter of the war against Sendero Luminoso and so there are still huge geographical as well as ethnic divides and the support for Ollanta Humala uh, a former military officer was strongest in those areas precisely that had been most marginalized in the war so you know in in almost all of the cases, you know, the, the findings of truth commissions that have called for reparations, that have called for more um, inclusionary policies of excluded populations have been ignored, have not been assumed either by governments or by society at, 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 at large. And, and those kinds of deficits continue to sort of linger and bubble, you know, under the surface. And I think in Peru accounts for this explosion in, in social um, in social conflicts over over mining investments, over who controls, you know, the revenues and the income, who damages the environment, and to what extent. So there there are huge tasks that are that are left in almost all of these countries. Well, Cindy, thank you for what was just a dazzling display of knowledge of both history and current events across a huge geographic region. That was a terrific primer. Appreciate it. And uh, for those of you interested, there's a lot more in the book. Uh, as much as Cindy just gave us a pretty in-depth analysis, there is a wealth of additional information. Congratulations on reaching the finish line. Thank Thanks you. for joining us today. Thanks, John. A in pleasure. the wake of war pleasure is the book. to be with you. Thank you. We'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.